Hello, my name is Calvin Bergsma, the pastor at Georgetown Christian Fellowship, which meets in Hudsonville, Michigan. The following is a message that was delivered on Sunday morning. Be blessed as you join us in the service that's already in progress. Today's message is uh, begin with hope. And really, the entire message is coming from one of the most famous scriptures in the Bible, and that's 1 Corinthians 13. And in that chapter, it ends with now. Faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And I want to speak for the next three weeks on motivating you. Having you see that which God has clearly put as central to the message of his salvation. Faith, hope, and love. I want to have you see those words as motivators that change you. Faith, hope, and love, three words that describe our interaction with God. <laughs> First of all, God's interaction with us begins with love. It says in, in 1 John 4, 9 through 10, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because God sent his only Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. He took care of our sins. It was a God thing. Love is a God thing. He initiates it. It is not us who can by any means reach God. It, we are powerless to overcome the obstacles that separate us from God being sin. It's just our state. But God being rich in mercy. <laughs> but God. But God. Oh, I, I love the fact that he loves us. And he initiated and started our life by pouring his love out on us. But our interaction with God, with our interaction with God, begins with hope. Hope is the belief that help is available. Hope is a result of hearing God's word. Romans 10 verse 17 says this, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So God is the one who offers his love in a way that we can understand and receive. The next three weeks, we'll be speaking about these three words as core motivations that should influence our lives. A motivation is that which moves one to action. As the dictionary says, the reason one has for acting or behaving. Well... I think to me that says that which moves one to action. It's simple. Some of the synonyms for motivation are the incentive, the stimulus, the stimulation, inspiration, the inducement to in, the incitement or the reason. Motivation is that which moves one to action. It's the attitudes or beliefs that induces us or influences us to do what we do. In some ways, if we know someone's motivation, we will begin to understand what it is they do and why. But even if a person's actions are good, their motivations might be wrong. And eventually, that too will be made evident. So if we judge people just by their actions we might misunderstand because if the motivation is wrong, they might have a whole wrong reason for doing what they do. And so let's read 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, 
I've become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but if I do not have love, I'm nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, assumed for a good purpose, martyrdom or something, but I don't have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Now, as I read this list here, I want you to consider why you do what you do. Why do you live for God? What is the reason that you're living for God? Is it motivated by love? Is it, are these fruits of the Spirit manifested in your life? Because if, they, if, if a man says he loves God and hates his neighbor, he's a liar. The truth is not in him. So this is going to describe in some way the fruit of the Spirit that you claim to represent in this life. Your words don't mean much to the world. Your actions mean everything. And sometimes your actions in this scripture is going to show your actions might even look right. But God looks down and he views your spirit, your soul. He understands what, why you do what you do, your motivations, all right? So is this what motivates you? Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag and it is not arrogant and it does not act unbecomingly. That means, <laughs> whoa, that was over the line. They're like out of control. That's what it means there. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. In some translations, it says easily provoked. In other words, are you sensitive that if you, you just have to approach that person the right time at the right way, or they just go off? They're very sensitive. Love isn't that way. All right? It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. And it bears all things, it believes all things, and hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. There come a time where we don't have, in heaven, there will be no prophecy. But for right now, as it will make clear later in the passage, that is a, a gift to us. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. And if there are tongues, speaking in tongues, they will cease. And if there is knowledge, and this isn't talking about knowing things. This is referring to the spiritual gift of the word of knowledge. That is something. It's not like we're going to, at a certain point, we won't know things. It's referring to the spiritual gifts. There will be no need for the gift of the word of knowledge in heaven because we will know as we are known, all right? If there is knowledge or words of knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child and I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I did away with the childish things. For now, right now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, that's when we see Jesus. Now, right now where we live, I know in part. I got a lot of things I don't know, what, a lot of questions. But then I will know fully, just as I have also been fully known. I'll know myself clearly. But now, faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these is love. That is the passage that will hold the entire series I'm going to be speaking on. There'll come a day when all your questions are answered. And all the challenges in life will be solved. Heaven will be grand. But until then, we need to know how to live our faith right now. Practically, how do we live our faith now? We need to be properly motivated or moved to action by the resources that God provides us right now. 
Now, right now, faith, hope, and love abide. I like that uh, word abide. When you abide, it's where you live, right? It's, uh, you can almost be thought of as, right now, we live with faith, hope, and love, right? That's what we've got to live with. Now abides, these three, faith, hope, and love. Today, I want us to look at hope, the first part here. And though each of us have unique life experiences, our journey from cradle to grave, it's all different. But we all share one common motivation, and that's the motivation of hope. And it's one of the strongest motivations. The definition of hope is a feeling of expectation, a desire for a certain thing to happen. A synonyms are, you know, aspiration, desire, wish, expectation, ambition, aim, goal, plan, etc. Hope is given to all who breathe. Hope, we're born with that. I like the, the phrase, that, I don't know who wrote it, but hope springs eternal. I'm telling you, I, it, it's amazing. Every human being at one point was when you were young, you had a lot of hope. And it, see, it wasn't even necessarily well-grounded. But some of the things you hoped for, yeah, that'll happen, that'll happen. You know what I'm talking about? Hope is, a, is, is something that you've seen. It's evident from birth as a baby reaches for his mother, believing that mom can give everything that they need. The very reach of an infant is, is an expression of hope. And, or also to see a child jumps out of bed in the summertime and, and with all the expectation of sunshine and play all day, right? They jump out of bed. What is that reason they jump out of bed? They've got ahead of them a vista of life and living, and it spurs from this natural thing of hope. Now, so I would like to think that as we get really old, I would like to have the, the no pains to jump out of bed with that same unbridled hope. But how many know that, that uh, there's things that can whittle away at the, at the hope that so uh, in, invigorates the young? But life soon teaches all of us that every hope is not always realized. <laughs> and as the list of failed expectation grows... The, the power, the motivating power of hope seems to dissipate. As we have hoped in things and it didn't happen the way we thought. Reality is a sobering thing sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Have you ever had a failed expectation? I want to know if I'm talking to the right crowd. Some of you, I just want to be you. Because you have never had a failed expectation. How many have had a failed expectation? You expected something, hoped for something, and it didn't happen. Okay, then I'm in the same place. I'm in the right place. Disappointment is failed expectations. <laughs> Hope is a natural motivation. Every human is born with it. It reaches with expectation. It starts out that way. It jumps at opportunities. And it sees the available resources that's available and jumps to use them. That's what hope does. I could do that. I could do this. You want to end up putting a bunch of stuff on the floor and put a, release my little grandson, James or, or Hayden. I'll tell you what, those kids, they could have see a lot of potential in anything. They, they, they have a way of making a mess out of it, but that's part of the whole thing in this message. All of the resources that are, we are available to us, we grab onto and think we can make it happen with that. We have that hope springs eternal thing. But sadly, most people's hope initially is placed in self and what the world offers. It's not God. In Proverbs 14, 12 through 14, it says... There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is the way of death. It's the path. It, it will lead to eminent failure, eventual. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Even in laughter, the heart may sorrow. Have you ever seen people laugh, but inside they're crying? 
That's what uh, the cynicism of, of failed expectation gets to a point where you can go through life and you can laugh. But inside, it's hollow. At the end of mirth, maybe grief. The backslider in heart will be filled with his own way. If you want to know what backsliding is, it's reverting back to your own way. But a good man will be satisfied from above. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't want to be insensitive here. So brace yourself. I know some of you go through some terrible things. And maybe are in the middle of some things that are so devastating. That hopelessness is where you have found yourself. And I don't want to be insensitive. But I feel the Spirit of God wanting me to give you a word of hope in your hopelessness. I don't want to be insensitive, but the sooner one comes to a place of hopelessness in something that will eventually fail, the sooner they will be free to place their hope in God who will not fail. I'm going to say it again so that you do not misunderstand what I say. The sooner one comes to a place of hopelessness in something that will eventually fail, the sooner they will be free to place their hope in God who will not fail. I have talked to many people in my life who come to me and as I talk to them, I see latent within them the seeds of ruin. Because, and they might have everything going for them. They've got their, their resources, their plans, everything is going fine. And I see, and they might even be honest enough to say, I'm hurting, I'm feeling that even as I grasp each individual accomplishment that I've hoped for, it turns to sand in my hand. And I go forward and they call and say to me, what, what do I do? And like the message that was presented by Andy the other day, where their hope was in riches and God knew that was their strength and their hope. And he then put his finger on that and said, sell all that you have. Lose it and come follow me. Come, let go of what you hold. Then the man turned away, as you know in the story, and he walked away sorrowful for he was very rich. His hope and his strength and his confidence was in something that would eventually fail. No one at the end of life wants to know what their assets are and wants to play with their money. They want a hope and they reach for God who is eternal if they are believing. If not, where is that all they might rely on now? Proverbs 13 verse 12 says that hope deferred or put off. I was expecting this and it didn't happen. Hope delayed makes the heart sick, but a longing that is fulfilled is a tree of life. And God is the one who is someone who can fulfill our satisfaction, and we, he will not fail. <laughs> Isaiah 49, verse 23, those who hope in me will not be disappointed. In Psalm 25, verse 3 says, yes, let none who trust and wait hopefully but look to you, be put to shame or be disappointed. There is a place that you can fixate and invest your hope in that will pay a dividend of peace and joy. God, it, it, I've actually been encouraged. Again, here, brace yourself. I don't want to be insensitive. But at times, I have received hope when I see people who have lost hope and in self and have hit bottom. It has been encouraging to me as I talk to the people that I meet whose hope is misplaced and they feel like the world is crumbling around them. And they come to me and say, I'm hopeless. In my heart I go, I got hope. We can do something about that. 
because they've let go of the substitute. I've seen the release and the relief of the closet alcoholic who when visited in the hospital because of a drunk driving accident which was the result of his secret sin which he didn't want to be brought out which he probably worked to hide and I've seen the release as I see that person and they see me coming to the hospital emergency room and they reach out to me free and joy in the middle of their most terrible trouble. Why is it a relief? There's hope. Hopelessness has been replaced with hope because what they put their trust in before fell. And God delivered that man and now walks in righteousness. Last night I was over and talking to a policeman. Talked to a few policemen last yesterday, just simply in my day. I don't know, more than one. I was good. <laughs> I was just reporting bad. <laughs> but but I'm, I'm, I'm listening to a, man, a policeman, and as I share with him a little bit of what I was going to speak on today, and I said, did you ever see a... A, a criminal or a man on the run that when finally captured and he puts his hands out to be cuffed, there's a, sign of, a sigh of relief from the man. And he says, I sure did. That is not an uncommon thing. Hopelessness at times can give a person hope when you come to the end of your own resources. And I've seen and sat with teens who've struggled with the secret and older people who st struggled with a secret sin of pornography, the things that were done on the internet in darkness. And when the gig is up and they are exposed and be sure your sin will find you out, you think that what you do in secret will not someday be broadcast from the rooftops, literally on the internet. You're fooling yourself. Warn you people. But I've seen those who have been caught in their sin. Finally have the light shined on it. And in the middle of their humiliation and shame. There is a release of joy. Because this, now I'm hopeless. But now there's hope. I challenge you. Fall on the rock and be broken. Lest the rock fall on you and be totally destroyed. The scripture says that. David understood and described the progression of despair and hopelessness into hope perfectly in Psalm 32, 3 through 7. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long for day and night your hand was heavy upon me my vitality was drained away as with the feverish heat of summer his motivation for doing anything was sapped but I acknowledged my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in time when you may be found today, now, surely in the flood of great waters, they will not reach him. There'll come a day when you will reach and he will not be there if you procrastinate it. You don't know the time of your demise. Amen. You are my hiding place. God, you preserve me from trouble. And you surround me with songs of deliverance. Hallelujah. I see hopelessness as the staging ground for salvation. Hopelessness is the precursor to deliverance. When our flawed ways fails, we are ripe for God's deliverance. Jonah 2, 1 through 2 says this. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the stomach of the fish. And he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord. And he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. And he heard my voice. 
Jonah 2, 1 through 2. The things that you fear most of losing are the things that God wants you to let go of and fall and let it fall. This, I, don't, I, I want you to close your eyes for a couple seconds. All of you have fears in your life. You might be going through a struggle that goes, I don't know how I will get through this. What I'm facing is I don't have enough finances to pay the bills. I am sick. I'm hurting. I have a relationship that is so broken that I have lost hope that it could ever be restored. I have a problem that he mentioned with pornography. I am a hypocrite. And God knows. And everyone thinks and pats me on the back because I look so good and I've got it down to a science. I'm good at my hiding. Which one of those comes to mind? And you say, I'm hopeless and undone in the presence of God. <laughs> well, today, you can step from hopelessness into hope. Because that is the entrance point into the plan of God for you. And it is this message is for the church. It is not for the sinner, first of all. Let's start in the house of God. Let us, first of all, make sure that those who preach the message are the message. And that someday will not stand before their maker. Knowing that they are empty. Knowing that eminent destruction will come and they will be here. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I choose to have never known you. This is the thing that most is to be feared. The acknowledgement of the truth in your condition. It might be something financial. It might be something lesser than that. But I challenge you right now in the darkness of your quiet right now, facing your fears, I want you to fall on Jesus and let it come out in your heart. Say, God, confess your sin as David did. And the threshold of salvation will be walked through as you are honest in your hopelessness. I want every head bowed, and first of all, every head bowed, and this is not a light measure because this is serious. You would not want anyone seeing this. But if you are right now struggling with a fear because you know that you're undone, you might have been saved, you might have given God your life, but you have taken over the reins and you're struggling and you feel hopelessness and you have given up in some ways. And you want to be set free. I'm not going to have you embarrass you or come up because that's a private thing. I don't want to further pile on to your hopelessness. But I want you to raise your hand right now because I'm going to pray. Okay. Some have raised their hands. All right. Now, you can put your hands down. And I'm going to pray a prayer in this body of believers of those who are beggars at a banqueting table. Looking to God to provide and satisfy. We'll pray for you. Oh Lord, we come in Jesus' name. And I come against the spirit of despair that lies to them. And tells them there is no hope. Lord, I point to you and I look to you, my Savior. And I pray that you would come along each one of these dear ones. Who have given up on the gig. The gig's up. 
And they, they, they think just might be hope on the horizon. I might be free. I might have life. And I pray, dear God, that you would come in like a blazing uh, rescuer that you are. And I pray that your light will dispel all darkness and that every demonic force that threatens their security in you, God, would be put to flight. I rebuke every spirit of darkness, every deception, every lofty thought that exalts itself against the name of the Lord. And I pray and call for your dear, for you, O oh Lord, to send your spirit down and bring it to a transforming work. Change from the inside. The motivation in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that, that hope will spring from you. And that joy will return. And that they will believe what you said. That those who call on the name of the Lord will be saved in their trouble. And you will lift them up and you will bring them to a place of joy and peace. Thank you, Lord. I praise you, God. I praise you. That is the fact that hopelessness is gone. There is a way. Now also for those who are struggling with things that are less significant, but also intimidate and threaten them. Whether it be physical disease and illness, from cancer to, to physical pains which fly, that continually nags and th challenges their faith. I pray, Lord, that you would come through from them in a huge way. I pray, Lord, that, the, that first of all, I ask for your healing. I ask, Lord, that your deliverance would come and that your flow, because they have repented and looked to you, oh Lord... You would touch their bodies and miraculously heal them. That is my request, O oh God. But in their time of faith and waiting for God to deliver them from their pain, I pray, Lord, you deliver them in their pain and they would receive through faith the joy of that which they desire in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Lord, I now pray for those who are financially struggling, who have don't, do not see a way. I pray, Lord, that you would open up a way for them. I pray that peace and joy would come to them before the provision. I pray, Lord, that the hope that uh, those that place their trust in you, as they intentionally do this and cast their care on you, Lord, that you would satisfy their souls. And then I pray, God, it's such a little thing for you to come through and give them provision. Oh, God, we ask this and put our needs before you, Lord. And all God's people again said, I hope you've enjoyed this. To hear other messages by Calvin Berksma, go to facebook.com forward slash GCF Church or youtube.com forward slash GCF Messages.